We got a sell-off into Jobs Friday, live from Studio 2 at Bloomberg Headquarters in New York. I'm Alex Steele. And I'm Shanali Basic. We Welcome. turned red on the day. We did. What it happened? Feels like it was no great. one wants to have any kind of big positioning uh, headed into Jobs Friday. Shanali is here with us for the next couple hours. So we're kicking you off to the close right here in the U.S. So the S&P is now down about seven tenths of one percent. There was a lot of Fed speak. They said nothing different, but just some of the highlights. You had Goolsby saying they need more in order to cut. Uh, Kashkari saying that why cut if the economy is strong? Sure, nothing new necessarily. Maybe we're taking it in a different direction. Uh, the Mag Seven I did want to highlight because Meta got a nice uh, price target upgrade over at Jefferies, and that was helping the Nasdaq 100 kind of maintain its outperformance so far today. A 10-year yield as stock sold off, going to go into bonds, particularly in the long end, down three basis points. I just want to point out, talk about strong economy, copper, highest level we've seen uh, since 2020. Brent, also highest level that we've seen uh, since October. So you have these like industrial-ish commodities doing very, very well, Shanali. That really points to the underlying strength underlying strength. But for today, U.S. stocks are still wiping out gains because traders are awaiting a tomorrow's big payrolls report. Now, we're looking at a survey out by 22V Research showing that there's no clear consensus on the market's reaction to Friday's report. 29% think the response will be risk on, while 32% said risk off. And 39% are betting on a mixed negligible reaction. Not surprising, a market's still searching for direction here. Another story we'll be talking about is over at Goldman Sachs, getting an F. A prominent proxy advisory firm is telling shareholders to vote against Goldman's executive pay plan after the Wall Street Giants' top leaders were given lofty raises in a year when profits had slumped. And then we're also going to be talking about gold because it's retreating now as investors are digesting a slew of Fed speak. Alex, what is this relationship we have to real rates and gold? Yeah, it's so interesting because it has a lot of gold bugs scratching their head right now because fundamentally it doesn't really make a lot of sense of why you saw gold hit a 2300. Yes, I know we're backing off of that level, but nonetheless, it's been a phenomenal trade recently. So this is a chart. Uh, the orange line is the real 10-year yield uh, based on core PCE, so backing up core PCE from the 10-year. Then the white line is the gold price. This goes back five years to just give you some historical relationship. So as you wind up seeing the real rates get lower, gold does better in theory because inflation is moving higher and that's why real rates are deeper into negative territory. Thus, that environment is good for gold. We saw something similar uh, just flipped uh, early back in 2019, right? The weird thing now is that you're seeing both actually move uh, relatively in tandem. They're both kind of moving up. Real rates are still negative. They're about negative. 50, they're about uh, excuse me, positive 50 basis points. And you have gold at 2,300. I don't get it. That doesn't seem to make any sense. So either uh, you have gold it needs to retrace, or we're in a very different situation in the economy than we think than just by looking at real yield, Shanali. And we're going to kick things off. It's a perfect place to leave it with Gennady Goldberg, head of U.S. rate strategy over at TD Securities. That dynamic that Alex has brought up here, how do you view what's going on? And frankly, at the end of the day, who gets hurt in an environment like this? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I do think real rates probably can go lower from here. I think that's where we're kind of all headed. Um, I think there's room for five-year real rates especially to head lower. I think a lot of investors are looking at these markets realizing these are excellent levels to start to get in. The big fear that everybody's got is getting in too early you know, while rates are still actually on the rise and um, you know, getting a little bit hurt like they did last year. You know, last year is still very much on everyone's minds. Nobody wants to be the ones to get in too early before they get the top. And does that, does mm -hmm. that mean though that you're looking at like stickier, higher inflation? Like, is that my takeaway from what you're saying? I think it hedges you in both ways. Okay. Um, so the reason we like real rates over nominals is the carry is excellent for the next three to four months. Uh, you've got very strong carry dynamics. It allows you to be long duration. So you are looking for a decline in rates, and we are looking for the Fed to start cutting in June, despite all the Fed speak that we've had over the last couple of days. Um, and we are looking for rates to go lower. We're just doing it in a slightly better carry way, where you are also hedged for inflation remaining a little bit more sticky over the next couple of months. Well, speak to the next couple of months, because even if you think that rates are going lower, it has been quite the whipsaw here. This week alone, you've seen more than a 15 basis point move from peak to trough in the two year alone. So how do you play even the next few months? I think you want to buy dips. I think you want to be very careful about overcommitting and you know going all in at a certain level. You want to be able to basically 
continue to deploy capital as rates continue to grind a little bit higher, as real rates grind a little bit higher, you want to be able to deploy targeting a overall kind of longer term, lower nominal and real rate environment. We do think inflation is going to start to move lower over the next couple of months. We do think it will be enough for the Fed to cut by June. The question is, of course, as we've seen today, you know, they're all waiting and watching and they're saying data dependent. So the market's not got a lot of conviction. Are you surprised in the uh, nominal bond mar- uh, yield market that the move this week has been more in the long end than the short end? So adding in the data that we've seen, right, that hot manufacturing number, hot prices paid. Yeah, services came in a little bit uh, lighter. But nonetheless, is that weird to you? A little bit. Um, I think there's a lot of... What does that tell you? Maybe that's a better, yeah. more intelligent question. <laughs> you know, it, weird is a very good way to put it. I think okay. this week's been a lot of repositioning. Um, there's been a lot of flow-driven price action where I think we're trying to read into it a little bit too closely. And, you know, to your earlier point about gold and real rates, for example, there's a lot of things moving in opposite directions that maybe shouldn't be quite correlated. Maybe we shouldn't be reading into them. I think let's wait for the jobs number. Let's see exactly how it comes in and then reassess from there. And it's interesting because you've had some of the Fed speakers tell you don't look at jobs. You know, they've said look at the prices. That's the thing that's going to determine when we cut rates. And I think they're right. It's all about prices. Well, then let's do the thing that the Fed has said not to do. Look at jobs tomorrow. How do you set up for it? I think, you know, we've got a lower uh, jobs number call. We're looking for 180K on the headline, uh, 0.3 on wages, and a flat unemployment rate of 3.9. I think that kind of response gets you a a bull steep in a reaction. You know, front end led rally right off the bat, steepening of the curve. And I think that's the, you know, the risk off that everyone's going to put on. The problem with that is we're just going to wait until CPI next week. And then you have to wait until the next. There's always really a next data print. Um, So what is the pain trade then headed into, say, tomorrow or the next print? Like, where are we just too far? I think the pain trade is rates staying exactly where they are here for the next six months. And, and, you know, for here. It doesn't look crazy anymore. It doesn't. (laughs) And that's the issue. This market's been kind of penciling in, you know, around three rate cuts for the rest of the year. If that kind of decays into call it two or even one and let's say we're back here in September still talking about that first rate cut that is the pain trade and that's going to make it a lot more difficult for equities to hold up their valuations and it's going to make it a lot more difficult for rates investors as well. Certainly been a lot of pain trades in the last couple of months and certainly a few more ahead. Thank you Janati Goldberg head of U.S. rate strategy over at TD Securities ahead of a big day ahead of an even bigger week ahead. But now coming up next, a bold new take on the more than trillion dollar credit market. More on a new study finding little alpha for investors in overall returns. Plus, kiss, sing it all goodbye. The major $300 million move that has classic rock fans wondering what's next for the band. And Paramount analysts have questions about the media company's potential tie up with Skydance. We're going to speak to one of them in today's top calls. All that and more coming up next. This is all on the close on Bloomberg. KKR's co-head of credit and markets, Chris Sheldon, is out with a new note today. And in it, he says that private credit is facing competition as CLO and leveraged loan markets reopen. And he writes that we see private credit deals being taken out and replaced with leveraged credit capital solutions and expect the trend to continue as M&A activity increases. Private and syndicated credit markets are going to coexist together. And as M&A picks up, we'll see demand on the rise across the board. And joining us for more is Bloomberg's credit reporter, Olivia Raimonde, who wrote the story, talked to Sheldon. What does he see as the opportunity here, as clearly he sees some other opportunities being whisked away? Yeah, uh, Sheldon, Chris Sheldon sees a lot of opportunities in the credit market. He calls it the golden age for credit allocation, I think were his words exactly. And I think 
what the most interesting part of his letter was, was his comfort in going further down the capital stack in public credit and looking at mezzanine debt or double B CLO liabilities. That is not a market that was really open last year, especially when the leverage loan market was closed and we weren't seeing any M&A activity. That market is reopening now, and that's where this dynamic comes in between private and public credit. It's no longer an either or, or there's only one option. Um, lenders are going to, excuse me, borrowers are going to be able to choose from both. Well, so how does, how do you, how does he mitigate risk for that? How does he look at the risk profile uh, for both of those? Because I feel like everyone's like, golden age of credit, someone else is going to be left holding the bag when the money runs out, but I'm good. I think I think there was a really interesting academic study out today that we might discuss a little bit later about whether or not private credit actually generates alpha and exactly how we um, mark these um, assets mark to market. It's difficult. It is difficult. When, with the public credit markets like leverage loans and high yield bonds, you have very clear benchmarks right. and you have a lot of um, transparency about what the underlying assets you're investing in as a money manager. It's a more opaque world in private credit. Um, things not, are not necessarily marked, mark, marked, marked to market. <laughs> Bless you for bringing up that research. It was from the National Bureau of Economic Research, so certainly uh, a very stately body to come out with a word like this to say private credit offers no extra gains. No extra gains. after fees. So why invest? Why not just go to broadly syndicated markets instead? Well, if you believe that report, then you would think just go to broadly syndicated markets instead. I'm sure people in private credit, uh, KKR included, would say they disagree with this study and that they are generating alpha in their reports. But I think it, I think when I read this story, I like that there is a conversation happening around this because we've been doing a lot of reporting about the opacity of the private credit markets. And the truth is, is that there is a lot about the underlying loans that we don't know. It's not necessarily bad. It's possible that they're generating alpha. They're not all necessarily going to default, you know, in the next six months. But it's still investors still want to know, you know, what is in their underlying portfolios. And, and on the flip side, wouldn't they say like, oh, it's OK, because I'm going to hold this money for like 10 plus years. So even if stuff goes, does go bad in the next three years, it's fine because I have a 10 year time horizon. I, do, I just wonder, like, when that narrative runs its course. I'm so glad you brought that up because as a credit reporter, public or private, everyone always talks to me, you know, everyone's here to buy and hold. These are long-term investors with long-term investments. But look at Silicon Valley Bank last year. If you become a forced seller at the wrong time, that can play out really, really poorly for you. So while these investments are meant to be long-term illiquid investments, there's always a chance that you're going to have to sell, and you never know where the market's going to be at that point. Exactly. See, it's a head scratcher. Olivia, thank you so much. Bloomberg Credit Report, Olivia uh, Ramonde, thank you very much. Shanali, what do you hear when it comes to that from well, all your people? It's fascinating because KKR wrote this report in the first mm -hmm. place, not the one from the National Bureau of Economic Research, but this idea that you're going to face competition from leveraged loan markets. And you think about KKR as a private credit player here. So you're having one of the larger private credit players also kind of conceding in some ways mm -hmm. that the syndicated loans are back. So, you know, if you're an investor in the space, what does that mean yeah. is my big question. If, you, if private credit returns are going to be compressed because the banks are coming back in, then how do you pivot to find new deals, really, to get you that extra yield? And then are you chasing? It looks like everyone right now in the market is chasing. And there's yield, so much money they? in it, right? So like there's so much money. So how is it? It's a seller's market, basically. And then how is that going to get an investor any upside? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of competition. There was a really interesting reporting by Moody's as well that talks a lot about how these big private credit firms are going further and further in deal size and how that's creating risk that some might even consider systemic. And so this kind of battle for yield here we don't know the consequences yet, but certainly some could be pretty ugly. Yeah, like what Olivia was saying, going, going down the capital structure there. Um, interesting. All right, coming up, also interesting is Paramount, uh, getting closer and closer to a deal that would merge the Hollywood giant with an independent production company. It's sparking mixed reaction from analysts. And the main takeaway is that it's going to be messy and maybe in a multi-part kind of deal. That stock is down by 9%. Uh, more coming up on the close. This is Bloomberg.
I want to bring you some breaking news over here at Bloomberg. We have CVS Health is planning to cover through their drug plans over-the-counter birth control in the United States. Remember, this helps remove some barriers to obtaining oral contraception here in the U.S. as reproductive rights come under fire. But remember, Opil, this non-prescription drug from Perigo, will be added to the list. And you see Perigo on that news spiking on the heels of the latest breaking news from Bloomberg, Alex. Yep, off the highs, but definitely you can see that spike there on the intraday chart. All right, Shania, let's turn now to top calls to look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. Let's start with Hertz. So Goldman Sachs downgraded the rental car company to sell with a $7 price target. Now, the analyst believes the full extent of the company's pricing costs and unit pressures have not been priced into shares. She also says Hertz will need more love from investors when it works to stabilize those factors. Shares are off by almost 6%. And uh, go ahead and look at the big take from Bloomberg on Hertz. Super interesting by Eric Schatzker. All right, up next, you get a block getting the chop. Nice. To underweight from equal weight over Morgan Stanley. Price target set at $60. The analyst sees limited upside as the payment company lags an appeal to Gen Z. Uh, what is Gen Z? Is that is that 20s? Anyway, he says that the majority of Gen Z's spending potentially has already been captured primarily by competitors to its cash app service. Shares are off by 5%. And finally, Paramount an upgrade to peer perform from outperform over at Wolf Research as investors digest reports of a potential merger with Skydance Media. Now, analyst Peter Supino says the pros simply outweigh the cons. He also says the likelihood of a board approval is high. Shares, though, off by almost 10 percent today, and those are some of our top calls. Well, we want to hear more from that analyst behind the call. Peter Supino joins us now, managing director and senior analyst over at Wolf Research. Really an upgrade on this because all the research I've seen to indicate is that, look, this is messy. Shareholders aren't going to like it, and it's going to be a multi-stage process. It is so messy, and we upgraded the stock from underperform, uh, which has been our rating for most of the last two years, to peer perform, which is just to say that we don't really think it's a compelling, obvious, long or short. Um, I can build an interesting case for both, but I think the probabilities are pretty evenly weighted. And just to dig into that a little bit, uh, this is a wildly uncertain situation. Uh, but one thing we know with confidence is that this company is still generating a lot of cash uh, if they want to. They're reinvesting a lot of their cash flow into growth initiatives like Paramount Plus that are not making money. But another owner could run this business differently and in a way that we think supports this stock price. A bit of a silly question here because we're talking about this deal as though it is something that will definitely happen. It is still tentative from my understanding as well. And anything can really happen in the land of mergers and acquisition. Peter, how do you weigh any potential uncertainties around this deal? Yeah, the uncertainties are enormous. I mean, rumor has it that the company has entered into an exclusive negotiation with Skydance, which is a private studio controlled by uh, David Ellison, uh, as well as uh, Redbird, a private equity firm. Um, at the same time, rumor has it, the, the press reports that uh, Apollo Global, one of the most powerful private equity firms in the world, is willing to pay $26 billion, which depending upon how you treat the various share classes, might be 19 or $20 per Paramount share. Uh, and so it's very interesting that the company is talking or, or signaling to the press that it prefers the Skydance offer for National Amusements, which is Sherry Redstone's holding company, rather than the entirety of Paramount. Uh, it's very complex. You could end up in a shareholder lawsuit. Uh, the company could end up accepting a, 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 an Apollo offer. And it's also possible that nothing will get done here. Messy, 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 uh, like you were saying. Peter, what do you think the eventual outcome, not of the buyer, but of Paramount Plus, winds up looking like? I mean, it's no secret that it's the actual movie studio that holds all the value, no? The movie studio and the television studios. So Paramount owns Paramount Pictures. It owns uh, MTV Studios, which actually has some real assets, including the Taylor Sheridan uh, television series like Yellowstone and, and the spinoffs. Uh, it also has the CBS television studio, which has decades of valuable intellectual property in it, some of the biggest primetime TV series of the last 20 years. And so, as I said earlier, if you shut down a lot of the unproductive activity at Paramount Plus and ran the business simply to, to earn cash from licensing existing intellectual property, this company would generate billions of dollars of profit, and we think that's what Apollo is on to. Skydance's agenda is a little bit less clear. They're 
not bidding for the whole thing. They're bidding for Sherry Redstone's holding company, National Amusements, and then they have an interest in trying to merge their smaller studio with Paramount's larger studio. Hey, Peter, before we let you go, I'm really curious also in the other places of deal making in the media entertainment world, Endeavor. And if you think about its relationship to TKO, how do you see things maybe changing? Speaking of complex, uh, <laughs> fortunately, TKO is becoming less and less complicated after a six month period of time in which the list of overhangs on investor sentiment had six or seven significant items on it. Uh, the news that Endeavor is going to go private with Silver Lake and management as the buyers uh, simplifies life for TKO because investors no longer have to worry about TKO uh, being uh, harvested for financing for that merger that's been declared that it won't happen. And investors uh, also don't have to worry about sh distributions of shares owned by Endeavor. Endeavor has stated that they're buying uh, the, the, my, the buyout group is stating that they're taking private all of Endeavor, including its TKO stake. And so we took the deal as a real vote of confidence in TKO because Silver Lake and, and management, the ultimate insiders, are, uh, are levering up to buy uh, the entire 51 percent of Endeavor, which was in attributable uh, of TKO, which was attributable to the uh, Endeavor common stockholders. All right, Peter, thanks a lot. Super appreciate it uh, for joining us there. Peter Supino over at Wolf Research. And check this one out. A fifth Matrix movie is in the works. The Variety is reporting that Drew Goddard, as a screenwriter for The Martian, will write and direct the new film. Plot details have not been released yet, and it's unclear which actors from the previous films will return. I don't know, man. Just the first movie. That was it. It was only the first movie that worked. It's the only one I've seen, to be I honest. I was like, you haven't seen these movies, have <laughs> I've you? seen one of them. I knew it. I totally That's knew That's better one. than most social media or public media that I ever pay attention <laughs> to, right? It's all the same to me. But I am interested in knowing if Priyanka Chopra Jonas will be back, right? And also, does Keanu Reeves, did he make a presence in any of the other ones besides the first one? Yeah, he one? did. It was in every one. I didn't believe character in every one. Yeah, no, but Keanu Reeves is like super, he's like super popular. Uh, and, and he's like a totally like off social media brand. People like love him, so he's going to have to be in it. But it's going to have to appeal to like the younger kids who aren't going to be interested in the old school Matrix. You know, what's interesting about the Matrix. There's a lot of ties into this post-COVID era <laughs> with the Matrix yes. movies. Ain't that true? I've been told I should watch it again. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe you should watch it again. Okay, anyway, Fifth Matrix movie. There we go. Um, I do want to um, uh, talk about more, some more breaking news. This happened before, and I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, but you do have an equity sell-off that's picking up a little bit of steam down by nine-tenths of one percent, a movement into the bond market, and it looks potentially like one reason why was Neil Kashkari and those comments from just about a couple hours ago saying, if the economy is strong, why cut it all? And that's sort of been the unspoken theme that you know what, maybe we actually don't need cuts. Maybe we still get them, but maybe we don't need them. And that sort of moves the needle from three cuts to maybe no cuts. Um, it does seem that some positioning, if you look at six SOFR, for example, we could be positioning for maybe even a hike on, uh, on an off chance. And Chanelle, that feels like maybe that is the real uh, risk to the market narrative. Yeah, you definitely saw more of a bid in the bond market a little earlier. Now the two-year yield only up about a basis point, still hanging around under 466, but certainly divergence of views from the Fed mm -hmm. and certainly a divergence of views from the market yep. as well. I, I can also say maybe you just want to chill a little bit before Jobs Friday. That could be a two take a little bit of profit into that number. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, much more coming up. This is Bloomberg. It is 3.30 in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Alex Steele. And I'm Shanali Basak. And Alex, we are talking a lot about the Fed and the implications of rate cuts or the lack there of them. Yes, Anil Kashkari sort of bringing up the idea of maybe we don't see any cuts, and the repercussions are near and dear to both me and Shanali right now. So the article on the terminal says that Goldman's markets account uh, front runs the Fed with a rate cut on its savings account. Now, it's just 10 basis points, so it's nothing like totally crazy, but it goes from 4.5% uh, to 4.4%. Uh, full disclosure, we both have so many in the markets accounts. Um, but that feels like a big deal. It does feel like a big deal, particularly because you have Goldman offering one of the highest interest rates on these types of accounts. It's really Goldman 
Hilton and SoFi and a few other firms that offer this high of a rates, but the fact that they're already starting to come down shows you the direction of travel, yep. also shows you a big question mark on where people start to move money as these rates start to come down in accounts like this. It's such a great point. Like, is it just now money market funds or like, okay, I'll go put the, that money uh, in the stock market then instead. We've been waiting for the money to come off the sidelines. Does it actually uh, do that anyway? We're really into this, as you can see. Okay, turning to the economic data, as we have a jobs day out tomorrow, U.S. initial jobless claims today ticking up to the highest level in about two months. Applications rose to 221,000 last week, alongside growing mentions of layoffs. We also get that jobs report tomorrow. Joining us now from more is Holly Wade, executive director at the Research Center for the National Federation of Independent Businesses. The NFIB is one of my favorite indicators because you can go through that in so many different layers and find really great nuggets about the economy. So Holly, it's truly a pleasure to talk to you. I know you can't like release the survey data because it's coming out next week, but can you just walk us through sort of what your um, clients and respondents are talking about in terms of the labor market? Sure. So on the small business side, it's been kind of a rocky road for a lot of small business owners, depending on the industry that they're in. But right now, labor pressures have eased a bit from their peak uh, in 2002, certainly. Um, but we're still finding anywhere from about 28 percent, about 18 percent saying that their single most important problem is um, is labor quality and another 10 percent saying it's labor costs. So over a quarter, their main concern in operating their business is labor related. So it is still a problem for the small business sector, although easing up a bit as of late. How much are they really willing to fill new positions at this point? Do you feel that some of the inflation pinch is still too high for them to add new workers? Is that starting to cool down? Certainly starting to cool down. We have seen for over the last four months a decline in those reporting that they are planning to hire in the next quarter. And so that's been uh, receding quite a bit. And if you take out COVID, the, the early part of 2020, we're now back down as far as hiring plans to 2016. Ooh. So it's a long ways off from where we were before, but those unfilled job openings are still at a very high level, even though they are also off their peak quite a bit. What do you think it's gonna take to get those filled? Like where's the big, blank space here? So it, again, it depends on what industries you're looking at, but as far as say transportation and construction, they're still clamoring to find uh, applicants for those open positions to fill those jobs. And that's reflected in compensation. And when we ask our members about whether they're increasing, decreasing, or maintaining the same compensation in the last quarter compared to the previous one, um, still high levels of those reporting that they are increasing compensation, that they're planning to increase compensation in the next three months. So those levels are still historically high. Therefore, we can see where there's still pressure on small firms to retain their current employees, but also in trying to attract uh, applicants to fill those open positions. Now, another challenge I'm really curious about here, too, as we talk about interest rates, as we talk about the course of the Fed, is costs of borrowing. How much are higher interest rates creating a pinch for smaller firms? Well, certainly for those firms that finance equipment are looking to expand their business or even have customers who typically finance the goods or service that are being sold, they're having a lot of pressure in absorbing those costs. Mm. And we hear that from our members uh, daily. However, the, the level of concern or having it escalate to their biggest problem hasn't turned into what we see as more saying that it's their single most important problem. So while it might be one of their top concerns, it hasn't hit levels where we're concerned that it is the dominant problem facing small firms. But we do hear quite a bit of the frustration related to higher interest rates. Yeah, no one likes it unless you're sitting in a market savings account. Um, Holly, when, exactly. uh, when you give, uh, give me a sense about inflation in terms of how they feel about inflation and if, if things are sticky, if things are, are in disinflationary territory, and if you can give us any insight into the industries. 
Certainly. So on the inflation front, as we saw back in um, February, inflation outpaced employment as far as their biggest problem. So more are saying that inflation mm -hmm. is their biggest challenge in operating their business, their ability to absorb those costs. And for those industries in construction, uh, certainly residential construction, they're still feeling those pressures and having to absorb those costs. But there are a lot of industries that that remains their biggest problem going forward. And while we've seen a, a leveling off or an easing of those pressures, as we've seen an easing of pressures in the labor front too, there's still the dominant problem and concern and having owners having to pass those costs on to their consumers. Now, how do you see this impacting medium, small size businesses more than it is, say, larger ones? One question I have is as we walk out of this era, is there going to be a significant disparity between how the largest fare and the rest of the businesses in the United States? Oh, certainly. So for small businesses, they have a myriad of concerns that are very different from their larger counterparts. And one is all of these decisions in absorbing inflationary pressures, absorbing higher compensation costs, it all comes down to the owner having to make all of those choices themselves. And that takes a lot of time and energy and a lot of stress, to be frank for a small business owner to navigate those waters, whereas a larger firm has, you know, extra capacity, um, you know, more folks kind of in the room discussing what that might look like or how they should proceed forward. But a business owner is often on their own to try and figure out all this out. And it's new territory for many who haven't been through this before. Holly, before we let you go, just to tie it back to the to Jobs Friday, do you get a sense that if the economy kind of rolls over, how sticky do you think companies are going to be with the current employees that they have? Like, as in, not labor hoarding, but just much more reluctant to lay people off. Sure. So for small business, that's another area that's a bit different from their larger counterparts, is they don't generally have the capacity for keeping on staff when, um, you know, unnecessarily because they can't afford it. It's generally one of their largest costs in operating their business is compensation. So for those who might be anticipating um, slowdown in, in spending at their business, they might not then fill those open positions as, um, a, as immediately as they might have otherwise. So I don't know if the labor hoarding uh, scenario is uh, something that most small businesses have dealt with. Holly Wade, Executive Director of the Research Center at the NFIB, we thank you so very much for such a strong view of the economy here. Now, Alex, what's interesting to me here is you do have some economists and members of the market really starting to talk more about this idea of a K-shaped recovery oh, yeah. or that barbell economy. And you've got to wonder how much more disparity there would be with interest rates staying this high this long. I was watching a clip um, back from 2020 when I was broadcasting from my house talking about K-shaped recovery. So, like, <laughs> clearly that conversation uh, continues. Um, but just also to update, uh, the S&P is now down by about 1.1%. You're seeing 10-year yields down by about four basis points. So definitely move uh, into the bond market as oil pushes higher. Neil Kashkari raises the idea of no rate cut at all. All right, coming up, we're going to dig beneath the headlines here and Conagra Brands and check out why the packaged food goods company says investors saying boom chicka pop. I like boom chicka pop. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Bringing you in with some breaking news in the private equity world, Toma Bravo is said to target $20 billion for its next buyout fund. Of course, it's a very interesting fundraising environment out there, but Toma Bravo is one of the masters when it comes to the software world. Alex, why do we focus on Toma Bravo, founded by Orlando Bravo here, co-founded at least? They've really put a run for their money for other software-focused firms like the Silver Lakes of the world and the Vistas, and so a lot of deal-making over at that firm. $20 million. It's a big number.
It's a very big number. All right, let's talk about another big number. Uh, stock of the hour. We're looking at Conagra Brands. It makes everything from Swiss Miss, hot chocolate, bird's eye vegetables, and the shares are on the rise today after posting earnings and boosting its margin target. Joining us now from Morris Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Um, interesting because not every one of these kind of companies are doing just as well. So yeah. we are seeing some idiosyncratic uh, issues here. What, what do we notice on the upside? We certainly are. And it's interesting that you're mentioning all these brands because I'm looking at them on their website altogether. And not all their brands are doing well It's either. So it is idiosyncratic mm. even within. So I think that the biggest thing that we have going on here is a relief rally. This is the best day since 2020. So investors relieved by these results. Uh, they both uh, beat earnings and sales, but sales down 1.7% uh, on a year-over-year. -year. EPS earnings down 7% on the year-over-year, -year. but the trend is improving because they did beat estimates. Now, a few weeks ago, they were at a conference, and they talked about the idea that they were uh, improving trends, that they were actually doing okay despite the weight loss drugs. So, again, I think that we do have investors just a little bit relieved. This stock down a lot over the last year. Uh, it's interesting, though, given the fact that with these diet drugs, uh, grocery and snacking, that was the strong point. A couple of weeks ago when they were talking about doing okay with the weight loss drugs, they were saying frozen that their single meals were doing well, but frozen is actually a challenge. But when you put it all together, investors happy with the results. Abby, talk about Lamb Weston here, worst performer in the S&P 500. Yes. Uh, not a true competitor, but is certainly in a business where a lot of the diet is challenged. Yes, and it's interesting because both of these companies in the potato business, if you can believe it, French fries, frozen uh, potatoes, but Lamb Weston really plunging the worst day ever since being public since 2020. A double digit uh, misses on both top and bottom. They're blaming it on their enterprise resource planning system. I think that's a fancy way of saying, like, planning how items get to uh, mm -hmm. the shelves and get to the warehouses and that kind of thing. But investors and analysts not entirely surprised. They're saying that they expected this, worst fears confirmed, but it's not isolated to just this quarter. It may continue. So, yeah, that stock really getting hit. Yeah, it's interesting, too, how they were expecting it, but maybe, like, not this bad or this maybe bad, yeah. uh, this protracted. Also, it is a tough tape. The SP is down by about 1.5%. You're having a move into the bond market, uh, and oil is making a rally here as well. Brent at $90. So it's a really tough environment uh, for stocks out there right now. Thanks so much, Abigail. Really appreciate it. All right, coming up, we're going to count you down to the closing bells with Victoria Fernandez, Chief Market Strategist over at Crossmark Global Investments. This is a close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Alex Steele alongside Shanali Basic. Shanali, we're looking at a market here that continues to roll over. S&P off a full one percentage point at this point. It's dragging the whole of the market lower. Uh, a big portion of this is Neil Kashkari bringing up uh, the prospect of maybe no cuts at all. Uh, bonds getting a teeny bit of a bid. And also oil just really making a big pop over the last hour or so. We're now up one and a half percent for Brent, uh, over $90. Kind of a head scratcher, geopolitical risk. But then you have to sort of extrapolate, OK, is that inflationary pressure? Like, does the Fed take into account? Like, like what happens to gasoline prices, it just kind of spirals from there. Let's talk about that spiral because that Fed speak you were talking about, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari really moving the market. He said that if we continue to see inflation moving sideways, then that would make me question whether we needed to do those rate cuts at all. So for more market analysis, let's welcome Victoria Fernandez. She's chief market strategist over at Crossmark Global Investments. You think about these comments from Kashkari and you wonder where the consensus is in the Fed. How much pushback is there inside the Fed about the idea of rate cuts when inflation is still so uncertain? I mean, we actually thought at the last meeting we would see the dot plot change a little bit, but it kept three cuts in, but only by one vote. So it does tell you that there is some shifting going on um, between the individuals that are voting there. But it's not just Kashkari, who typically has been a little more hawkish. I mean, you've also got Barkin right, that came out and is saying, it's okay for us to take our time. He spoke earlier today. You've got Bostic that's been saying, maybe one cut is all we get so far. So I think you're starting to see a little bit of shift in tone, which matches what we've been thinking all year. Why are you going to cut when you have the strong economy that you do have and inflation is not dropping down to that 2% level? Okay, so we have to pair back even more from three cuts to something else. Where's the biggest mispriced in the market for that? 
Well, I think you're going to see yield shift, and we have saw it this week, obviously. We've had, what, 10 basis point move this week alone. So you've already priced a little bit of that. I think you'll see more of it coming um, in the bond market. Where we're not seeing it and we're waiting to see it, Alex, is in the credit market. Nice. That's where we haven't seen the pressure yet. That's typically once you get that credit crunch is when you get the pullback in the equity markets. I think it's one of the reasons we haven't seen a broader pullback so far this year. Talk more about that credit crunch because things have been super sanguine to the point that it's a little bit scary. Honestly. It is. It is. I mean, that typically is kind of your canary in the coal mine, right? You look at high yield spreads. You see those go out. That then filters through into your investment grade. We're just not seeing it. You look at investment grade right now, and it's trading within about 10 basis points of its lows. So it's pretty strong. But weirdly enough, that's because the economic data is still good. So, so you're getting kind of the story of both houses or whatever. Um, wh do you expect the data to turn and then all of a sudden we do have the cuts or do you expect inflation to roll over first and then we get the cuts? I think we're going to have to see some of the data come through and it's going to be from the labor market. I think until you see more distinct cracks in the labor market, you're going to have the support for the consumer through wages, through savings, through knowing they have a job um, and that's going to support demand and consumption. So we need to see some labor market weakness. But is that labor market strength really coming from this idea that there's a strong consumer and jobs available or the fact that there's still stimulus in the system. Well, both. And we are in an election year, Shanali, right? And there's not too many uh, times when you have a current administration up for re-election that there's not more stimulus brought in during the year. So I think you could actually see some of the pullback in the market get pushed off even further because you have some stimulus come in. You have some CapEx then that can be put to work from the CHIPS Act, from the Inflation Reduction mm -hmm. Act. And you could see a turnaround in China, perhaps. Um, we're seeing a little bit of that. We'll see if that continues or not. Not, but I think that could be a, a pushback maybe to what some people are expecting. Now, you're from Houston, Texas. I you am. flew in yesterday, so I got to ask you about oil. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's up with Brent at 90? What do you think is behind that? Yeah, well, there is quite a bit of support going on for crude right now. I mean, obviously, the demand is there, and we're seeing that. You are seeing... Um, OPEC plus continue to dwindle down um, what they're producing. So that is helping support the pricing. And you're seeing non OPEC plus countries, that's actually start to stabilize as well too. So I think you've got some supply concerns. You still have demand. And if China is starting to make a turn, that's gonna play into that as well. That's all supportive. Do you play oil stocks on this? I don't know if I would say we play oil okay. stocks. We like you the like energy oil sector. Okay. We, we like the energy sector. There has been such a pullback in that sector over the last year. Now we start to you know, see them do quite a bit better. With the price of oil moving higher, that means free cash flow is going to be much stronger for these companies. And we buy stocks based on what we see on their balance sheets. So you look at something like a Marathon Petroleum, Phillips 66, where you've got some transportation, some refinery elements. Those are the names we like in the space. I think there's no other way to put it. There are some jitters in this market right now. And so if you look at these pullbacks, where else do you start to buy? Well, so energy we do like. We just mentioned that one. Um, we like the financials. We know, again, these are areas that have pulled back, but they have solid balance sheets. You can go in and buy some of those names. And we like health care. I know some of the HMOs got hit earlier this week mm -hmm. with some of the regulation that's coming out. But you look deep into that sector. There's some opportunities there. And I think you're going to see those sectors earnings actually start to do better in the second half of the year, where the first half has all been dominated by the MAG-7. So a uh, headline crossing that money market assets hit another record, $6.11 trillion in the week that ended uh, April 3rd. I feel like this headline just comes out <laughs> week after week after week. Do you think that that money belongs anywhere or do you think it just kind of stays there? It's really tough when you're getting 6% or 5.5% on a money market, you guys were talking about it earlier, yeah. to move that out into somewhere else. Now, some of our clients are, right? We're moving them into kind of a combination. Put some fixed income in there. You can do the short end of the curve, so you're still getting that 5.5% go out and lock in some rates on the longer end of the curve so you continue to get that income, but find some of these opportunities we're talking about in the equity market that haven't been the main front runners and will start to do that later in the year and you can put some money to work. But if you're getting 6%, I don't think you take everything out at this point in right, time. Right, right, right. Exactly. So it doesn't belong anywhere 100%. Right? Exactly. Victoria, thanks a lot. Great to see you in person. My Thank pleasure. you for joining. Victoria Fernandez, Chief Market Strategist over at Crossmark uh, Global Investments, which just goes back to the point of like, 
where does that money wind up going? If you leave some of it there, does it go into tech because you got to own it? Does it go into sort of the cyclicals? And we see that rotation, the broadening out continue, uh, particularly as the data continues to come in strong. Right. You have some people wondering if they've missed some of the run up when it comes to some of those stocks that have been very loved over the last year. The other question I have is how fast does that rotation actually happen? Right. I've been see, we've been talking about this for a while. Right. So, yes. There are moments where you look at people, they are getting out of cash to finally rotate into other places. But does that money go to fixed income? Does mm -hmm. it go to equities? Or does it go into things that are safer, perhaps, like gold? Or do we, are we the indicator? Like, we're just regular Joes, like, putting our money into a market's <laughs> account. Like, when we do something, that's when, like, we're going to be the indicator. Yeah, and I like to say happen? follow the big money these days, but even they have had some painful trades. As we're definitely not. About, Alex. Definitely not the big money. That's true. All right, uh, we are moving closer to the closing bell. A quick check in here on the markets. You're seeing the equity market continue to roll over, led by uh, tech and healthcare, communication services and financials, utilities and energy, trying to make a run for it, uh, to try and get into the green by the close, but really not yet. We're taking you next to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. About two minutes away from the end of the trading day on this Thursday, I'm Alex Steele. Alongside Shanali Bassick, we're counting you down to the closing bell here to help us take us to the bell and beyond with a global simulcast. We're joined now by Scarlett Fu here in TV, Tim Senevic and Jess Menton joining us over in radio. We're bringing together our Bloomberg television, radio and YouTube audiences worldwide to parse through the most crucial moments of the trading day. And Tim, you know what? The most crucial points were like the last hour and a half. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there were two crucial things that just happened in the last 90 minutes. One, some hot hawkish Fed speak from none other than Neil Kashkari saying, wait a second, we might not get the data that we need in order to justify any rate cuts, cuts so far this year. Uh, and then, of course, Alex, I mean, well into what, what you talk about each and every day, the price of a specific commodity, none other than Brent crude, spiking through $90 a barrel for the first time going all the way back to October. I think that's got uh, investors a little skittish. And just looking over at the major indexes, heading into the final minute here before the close, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100 both down about 1%. So if the S&P holds on to this, it would be its first 1% decline in about a month, Scarlett. Yeah, even with the hawkish talk, though, from Neil Kashkari, you would think that that would send yields in the other direction, but you have yields declining. So hmm. it really just goes to show how uh, the comments out of Netanyahu um, really sparked a flight to safety when it comes to bonds and, of course, uh, oil moving, moving, moving up. I think also what's interesting is where you saw that movement in particular. You saw some really interesting moves in the longer end of the yield curve here, and that has been a really risky place uh, for some place that is supposed to have been safe over the last year and a half or so. So into jobs day, let's see if some of these moves continue. Yeah, you have to wonder, too, what is now the pain trade into jobs? Uh, speaking of, that is the closing bell on this Thursday. When you open up tomorrow, we will have those job numbers in hand. We're looking at a negative down day. It was really a sell-off into the close with the S&P down by about 1.2 percent as we settle out here. Uh, the Nasdaq up at 1.4 and volume quite heavy, Tim, uh, throughout the day. Yeah, taking a look, a uh, deeper look into the S&P 500 right now, uh, 75 stocks only in the green today, uh, 428 stocks in the red scarlet. Yeah, and if you look at the IMAP, it's pretty clear. The pie is almost completely red, at least if you look at the 11 sector groups in the S&P 500. Uh, there are a few slivers of green. I'll just highlight where they are. Real estate management up by six tenths of one percent. Autos and components up by half of one percent. But you're slicing it really thin when you get to that point. In terms of the big sector decliners, uh, tech off by one point seven percent. Healthcare losing one point four percent, along with communication services. All right, well, let's take a look at uh, how some of the gainers that I kept an eye on actually moved mm -hmm. lower in the day. I think they're all going to stay in the green. They certainly are. Meta Platforms is the one I wanted to start with. It was on track for much of the day to close at a new record. Uh, but ended up selling off with the rest of the market. Still, shares closing higher by more than eight tenths of one percent. Uh, it was as high as by as much as four point six percent earlier in the session. This after we saw price target increases from Jefferies and RBC. I do want to take a look at shares of Levi Strauss and company. Did, okay, this is something I learned, guys. Did you did you know that baggy jeans and denim skirts? <laughs> Are back? Yeah. Oh, Tim. Tim, like, where have you been? You is, live in Park I, Slope. So I'm are white sneakers. This is like, Dude, what, I, this, what is this? <laughs> junior so high? Like, <laughs> this is what we, this is what I wanted to wear in junior high. Like the baggy pants my the parents would let me buy. The 90s are so bad. Oh. Chokers. All right. <laughs> Love it. Know. It's true. I guess I gotta, gotta get on the TikTok and see what the kids are doing these days. Um, yeah. So actually. <laughs> 
denim skirts and baggy jeans uh, really helped Levi Strauss in the most recent quarter, in addition to cost-cutting measures that the company did implement. Um, shares finishing the day higher by more than 12.3%. Finally, uh, some deal news, uh, potential deal news, we should say, moving shares of HubSpot higher on the day. Uh, Reuters did report earlier in the session that Alphabet is talking with financial advisors about potentially making an offer for HubSpot. Uh, it's the marketing software company, and it would be valued at roughly $34 billion. Shares of HubSpot closing uh, today just shy of 5%. Trying to move over from denim skirts and baggy <laughs> jeans here, but I'm going to point out Fry's producer Lamb Weston, ticker symbol LW on this. It's down 19% today to the close. This is its worst percentage drop on record. If you do look at this, its quarterly sales did meet Wall Street expectations. It also cut its fiscal year sales and profit forecast. So you're seeing that stock very under pressure today. Another one I have to point out is Hertz Global HTZ is the ticker symbol on this. So Goldman Sachs ended up cutting its rate on the stock to sell from neutral. But the broker also raised its recommendation on its rival Avis from neutral to sell. So you are seeing that stock under pressure as well. But you do see Avis uh, actually turning higher today on based on that. And then lastly, I'm going to take a look at Block. So obviously, we know this is a payments company. Morgan Stanley did cut its recommendation on shares to underweight from equal weight. It did say the downgrade did reflect limited additional opportunity for the company's cash app to expand its banking credit services. Shanali. Yeah, I want to talk about the bond market now because it was one of those days that the bond market was really whacking the tail here. And you had the bigger moves actually not even on the shorter end of the yield curve. The two-year yield down by about three basis points to 464, but you saw about four basis point moves or more on the longer ends of the curve. 430 on the 10-year now, the 20-year 457, 30-year at 446. So a bit of a haven trade at a place of the market that's been seen as a little riskier these days. So moving ahead, you got to wonder what's going to drive the market more? Is it going to be Fed speak or is it going to be comments out of the Middle East with regard to what could move oil prices? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think tomorrow the focus is on jobs and, you know, what kind of surprise we get would actually spook markets. I think it would have to be a really big surprise, either the upside or the downside, Alex. Um, yes. I, you know, I don't see, given that we got some hotter than expected numbers over the last couple of months, and it didn't really move things in, in terms of the way that investors were thinking about rate cuts. Um, but what I do think is interesting is sort of the change in tune that we got from Kashkari earlier today. Yeah, I was definitely focused on Kashkari. Um, however, Halima Croft over to RBC uh, had a note out that was quite worrisome this morning. Uh, she was saying that the, there's a risk that Iran's going to have a more serious response and then target mm. uh, Israeli uh, leaders more directly um, and that that could be a material risk and really move up the ladder uh, in terms of, ge of geopolitical problems. Um, and that's going to be huge. But, you know, you, it's hard to price that in. Maybe you can do that a little bit with oil, but it's hard to price in those exogenous events. So then you have to go wind up looking for just the jobs number and Kashkari and looking for maybe yeah. no cuts and go that way. Of course, also keeping a close eye on the bond market, to Shanali's point, I mean, at a certain point earlier this week, you saw the 10-year Treasury yield move about 20 basis higher from where it had ended last week. Obviously, it's come off from that. It's around 430 at this point. But even just looking at today's sell-off, Alex and I were actually chatting about this yesterday. It's, it's been about 281 trading sessions since the last time the S&P 500 actually saw a 2% decline. So that was a little over a year ago. So even with today's uh, sell-off, and it's a one, more down more than 1%, I mean, that's its biggest loss in about a month there. Well, we spent quite a bit of time this week talking about the new minimum wage law in California, which saw an increase of 25% for a minimum wage from $16 to $20 an hour. And as a result, we've seen some companies raise prices. We've seen a lot of companies try to figure out, okay, how can we make things more efficient? You have one uh, fast casual chain uh, based in Guatemala, but has uh, restaurants here in New York, um, a fried chicken chain. It's called Pollo Campero. I don't know if you guys have ever been there, mm -mm. but what they're doing is they're redesigning their stores to make it more efficient for the people who work there. So they're actually, instead of walking 18,000 steps in a single day, which is more than three miles, I'm shocked that you know people who, who work in fast food are, are walking that much. That's just so much to walk, down to 9,000 steps a day. And it's saving time. And of course, it's saving on labor. Wow. This is an amazing story here. And just seeing in general what it could mean for those particular label costs here. Uh, but actually, Tim and I were speaking with a, an executive from Verizon earlier, just talking about how they're implementing when it comes to AI and their technology and what it could mean when it comes to labor productivity, but then also customer service and what that could basically mean as far as making things more efficient. But then also he was actually telling Tim and I that most of their customers, one of some of their top questions are they don't necessarily want uh, it to dramatically 
automatically to everything moved to AI because they still want to talk to customer service representatives. Absolutely. I mean, have you been to places where you can order through kiosks? Most of them don't work <laughs> no half thanks. the time, and then you have to get in line exactly. anyway to talk to the person, except that person is overworked, no matter if they're taking 19,000 steps or 9,000 steps. Yes, 100% preach. Totally agree with you. Um, but I think it also points to the fact that, like, revamping kitchen restaurants is really hard. This is why it took, it was so hard for McDonald's to do any kind of all day breakfast thing because it's mm. not as simple as like flip the burger here, do the eggs over it here. Didn't it didn't take years so for them more. to roll it out across <laughs> the entire company? Yeah, no, it took a really long time because it's super complicated. So I thought that that kind of choreography, it was quite different. But I also wonder if they can't increase costs and if prices keep rising and they and the productivity gains kind of wear out, like then do they have to lay people off? Like what's the next... What's the next trigger that they can pull? Certainly dealing with macro challenges as well as consumer preferences changing. Speaking of consumer preferences, hard pivot. Did you know, guys, <laughs> that KISS hmm. is selling its music catalog here to a firm that is trying to use that brand and make it last through the generations. I wanted to talk about this story because, Tim, just like those jeans that you were talking about, you might not <laughs> know that my nine-year-old niece actually has Kiss as her favorite artist. Really? So that oh, is wow. another one. Not Tay-Tay? Is that like a <laughs> Isn't that amazing? thing? Nine years old. A oh nine-year-old? You know, you have to go to Brooklyn and see if the rest of the school <laughs> thinks so, but like at the same time, lives in Brooklyn. It is, you can see how you can keep making money off a brand like this and why Look. Frankly, this is a really hot new private equity play. Frankly. Yeah, I mean, it's just the latest in a line of, of singers and songwriters selling various portions of their catalog for many hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I would argue that Kiss's IP. name, image, and likeness is more valuable than its song catalog. Can you name a Kiss song? <laughs> no, no, I no, actually but I know exactly <laughs> what Gene Simmons and everyone look like, right? right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, guys, that is going to do it for our cross platform coverage of today's market close. But don't go anywhere because Bloomberg TV continues its coverage as do we here on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Originals. Meantime, catch us same time, same place tomorrow. Happy almost Friday, everyone. All right, coming up on the close, getting an F, a prominent proxy advisory firm telling shareholders to vote against Goldman Sachs' executive pay plan. We've got more on that coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Shanali Basak. We're going to take a look at where the markets ended here because it was kind of an ugly day, wasn't it, Scarlett? The S&P 500 down a uh, pretty meaningful pace, 1.2% on the day. And again, this is ahead of a jobs day. There was a lot of news crossing that tape over the last hour of the day here. The tech-heavy indices fared worse. The SOC Semiconductor Index is down more than 3% on the day here. So some of the favorite trades in the market starting to see some pain. You had New York crude oil here uh, up above 86 now. So significant gains, 1.5%. Remember, the gains over the last week were even more stunning. Of course, there's a lot of conflict in the Middle East, and the markets are digesting that. And the two-year yield is also seeing some digestion of geopolitical conflict here. You had a two basis point move to 464 on the day, again, ahead of a very busy jobs day. So strange to see such moves at the end of the day. Absolutely. Let's get you a couple of individual movers. I only picked out two because they're pretty sizable here. Lamb Weston falling almost 20% on the the day. This is the biggest decliner in the S&P 500, and this is after the company, which makes uh, frozen french fries and hash browns and counts McDonald's as its biggest customer, uh, cut its full-year sales and profit forecasts. Now, AppLame is a tech transition which is disrupting operations, but perhaps more concerning is a soft restaurant traffic trend that the company highlighted. So, investors punishing that stock. Hubs, this is HubSpot, up about 5% on the day. It had gained as much as 9%. Uh, that's after Reuters reported that Alphabet may make an offer to buy this online marketing software company. If true, this would be kind of an unexpected and unusual move for Alphabet at this point, for Mag7Name in particular, given how much scrutiny regulators, antitrust regulators, are giving to that sector. Uh, especially when it comes to current deals and past deals. So we'll be keeping a close eye on this one. And that actually brings us to our top story this hour. And that is a conversation on crafting a responsible AI strategy with Google's top lawyer. We're going to go live to the Bloomberg Intelligence Generative AI event, where Alex Steele will be sitting down with Halima Delane Prado. She is the general counsel of Google. They'll be covering both accountability and liability concerns. 
very Ollie. much looking forward to that story this hour. And another top story on the Bloomberg terminal right now is Goldman Sachs getting some pushback against their executive pay plan. And a prominent proxy advisory firm, ISS, is telling shareholders to vote no, citing significant disconnect between pay and performance. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg senior banking reporter Sridhar Natarajan. Let's talk about what Glass Lewis in particular is saying and ISS because they both have different uh, conflicting views here, if you will, with what management wants to move forward with over at Goldman Sachs. Two different things, but they also have identified two different problem areas. ISS, for instance, is backing the proposal that Goldman Sachs needs to separate the role of the CEO and chair at many top U.S. banks. That's usually the same person, but it also highlights some of the challenges Goldman faced over the last year. Glass Lewis not only backs the same proposal, but also is saying that shareholders should vote down the say on pay, what we call the say on pay compensation proposal for the top executives. That is a non-binding vote. A company doesn't necessarily have to care for it, but the reality is a lot of these big banks and their executives pay attention to it because that is a way for shareholders to express dissatisfaction with either the top executives or the company's performance, and that's why it's concerning for Goldman. How much sting, to your point, do these proposals actually have? We've seen similar situations in the past. J.P. Morgan, for example, has faced a proxy advisor really refuting some of the special pay plans, if you will. Do you think that the Glass-Lewis plan will have a difference? It, 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 it can add up over time. Right now, it seems that Goldman has actually righted the ship a little bit. It went through a lot of challenges over the past year. It, it changed its strategy. It tried to undo a lot of its missteps and find the right strategy and gone to a strategy that people appreciate Goldman Sachs for. However, say six months down the line, they are hit with some of the problems. This will come back to the front of everyone's mind because these advisory votes go back to your pre-crisis times when people believed that poorly structured incentive packages were in some ways responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. It was only after the Dodd-Frank Act that after 2010, these actually became a formal part of these annual shareholder meetings where shareholders actually have a say on executive compensation plans. That is why, even though it's non-binding, companies, banks, and their management are always trying to ensure that they can get as much approval and support for these plans as possible because they don't want any hint of dissatisfaction out there. What is Goldman saying in response to this? Well, that's the other interesting part here. What did they actually do? Goldman CEO's pay went up 24% to $31 million. $31 million, especially when it comes to its peers and other big bank CEOs, doesn't sound like a lot, relatively speaking. <laughs> However, it was for a year when Goldman's profit plunged by the exact same amount, 24%. So there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect on pay and performance. Goldman's board said that they were actually awarding the CEO for shifting the strategy, for simplifying the strategy. We have spoken to a lot of executives inside the firm who have privately griped that he's being awarded for actually fixing his own mistakes. That is the disconnect here. Also, we should mention as well that Chief Operating Officer John Waldron also saw his pay package jump 28% to $30 million. So it's not like Solomon's pay was uh, outsized compared to some of his uh, top executives. Sri, thank you so much as always. Sri Nanarajan with the latest here on Goldman and its pay for its top executives. We're going to stay with the financial sector because two of the regional banks that emerged as winners from last year's deposit runs are now seeing their fortunes diverge. We're talking about New York Community Bank. It required a frantic rescue last month, so that was the one that went down, whereas First Citizens has stretched its rally to more than double its value. Joining us now for more is Sally Bakewell, who helps lead Bloomberg's finance coverage. So Sally, as we get ready for the earnings season, which begins next Friday when JP Morgan starts reporting, um, there's a lot of questions about how these regional banks will fare, and it really is no one would have predicted that these two banks would have seen their fortunes go in such opposite ways. Right. I think the diverging fates of these two banks really lays bare the very tough catch-22 that is facing a lot of smaller regional lenders. And here is that conundrum. The U.S. banking landscape, to somewhat of a degree, is really rather overcrowded. There are about 4,500 banks. Now, the big banks, the big guys like J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, they have poured billions into expanding their reach across the country and into technology that attracts consumers to the, those banks. But for the smaller guys, that makes it hard to to compete without 
scaling up. Now, they can get bigger, they can merge, they can acquire other banks, but that brings with it a host of other problems. And one of those is the fact that it might well propel them into categories of increased and more intense regulatory scrutiny. And with that comes increased costs as you have to meet those steeper compliance and governance burdens. And to a degree, that's what's happening with First Citizens mentioned in this story. That bank, it actually acquired some of the assets of failed lender Silicon Valley Bank last year, and that helped push it towards a new regulatory category, and it becomes a larger, more complex financial institution. And that means that you know regulators are seeking for it to satisfy certain demands so that it can match that pace of growth in terms of its internal governance. Yeah, regulation is one challenge. It's interesting. A rating firm this week had put out a note also targeting all the commercial real estate issues that still exist among lenders around 100 billion assets or so, saying that more could fail. And if you're leading a banking team like you are right now, what are you looking for in terms of more trouble ahead? You, as we know with New York Community Bank, some of these issues came from an acquired portfolio out of last year's mess. That's right. Some of them did come from an acquired portfolio, but some of them didn't. New York Community Bank, you know, it had its problems in part because of its exposure to multifamily properties, which weren't actually part of the acquisition. But I think it all, you know, it all feeds into the bigger concern about commercial real estate and risks that a lot of these regional lenders sort of by default, they have a larger percentage of exposure to the commercial real estate landscape. So, you know, as they start reporting earnings next week, we'll be looking at how they are handling that exposure. Are they whittling it down? Are they trying to sell some of it? Are they writing some off? So I think this is a, a key area of focus for earnings next week. Now, I also want to talk about another massive winner. No secret here, JP Morgan has won over and over again in the wake of this banking turmoil. But more recently, so have its executives. They promoted a whole new wave of people. What do we know about how JP Morgan is uh, changing its top ranks right now? So. Indeed, it has been a big winner of this turmoil. And last year, it posted the biggest annual profit of any US bank ever. Now, of course, though, this brings sort of pressure internally for the bank to continue to rise to that sort of level of performance and to meet those challenges. It has been, under Jamie Dimon, um, moving some of its top lieutenants around in order to give them more experience running some of the operations for as and when he retires, even though he almost seems to say that he never will. Um, and so we just saw the sort of latest shakeup under the newly appointed appointed um, co-heads of its commercial and investment bank, Troy Robarg and Jen Peepsack. Again, it's part of his, um, Jamie Dimon's effort to sort of ensure that the, the successes are, are there. Okay, so more names that we need to pay attention to as we look ahead to the day eventually when Jamie Dimon actually retires, although that has yet to come to pass. Sally, thank you so much. Sally Bakewell leads our finance coverage here at Bloomberg. Now, coming up, we've got the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's big stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three, where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And first up is Harvey Schwartz, the CEO of Carlyle, given a $187 million pay package in his first year at the PE firm. We thought David Solomon was making a lot of money. Right, $187 million might sound like a lot, but it is pretty typical for a private equity firm to be paying this much. But it also shows you how much he's actually liked by the firm's mm -hmm. founders. And mm -hmm. frankly, he was in line to be CEO of Goldman. I think pay-wise, he's better off at Carlisle. Yeah, absolutely. He was a former CFO and co-president at Goldman before he left because it you know, he didn't win out uh, in the CEO race. But I think it's a good point you make, which is his really catering to um, David Rubenstein, for instance, and in, in making sure that they're involved as he moves Carlisle forward. Yeah, long road to go ahead. There's another name I'm watching, though, here as well. There's a lot of changes at the top at a lot of places. Mm -hmm. I am watching Jonathan Levin. He is the, the dean of Stanford's business school who has been promoted. He has been chosen to lead Stanford University as president. Of course, these elite universities have had a lot of attention lately. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Like other schools, Stanford's campus is in turmoil from protests tied to the Israel-Hamas war. And of course, Stanford specifically, the FTX scandal, since Sam Bankman-Fried's parents are both Stanford Law School professors. So there's a lot going on there. Um, Levin replaces the former president who had to step down after there were flaws found in research that he published. 
So a little bit of a not, not so graceful exit for his Research under a lot of attack these days. Yes, absolutely. By the way, Harvard and Penn still need to find their permanent presidents. They just have interim leaders. You applying? <laughs> I'm not. I don't come close <laughs> to qualifying. Okay, let's talk about another person here. And this is someone I know you are watching very carefully, too. Tiger Woods. He may not be the most dominant golfer anymore, but he's still the most influential golfer because there's a Bloomberg Businessweek story about how the putter that he uses at tournaments has made Scotty Cameron custom clubs into an asset class unto themselves. And I know you were fascinated by this because, uh, new fact, Shanali, you were on the varsity golf team in high school. I was on the golf team. There was no varsity. I was the only okay. woman on the golf team. You were team. on the varsity golf team. So I guess I was varsity by <laughs> by default. default here. But I think this is really interesting, the whole idea of a lucky putter. Apparently the putter is the only part of your golf set that you are keeping pretty much for life. Mm -hmm. And so he is tapping into a market. I wonder how profitable it will be for them. If you keep your pu uh, putter forever, do you need to ever buy a new putter? You don't use it that much. It doesn't go through the wear and tear of the other clubs. Um, but Scotty Cameron is the one that you really want. So that's the one you should watch for. All right. One other person we're watching is Redbird Capital founder Jerry Cardinal. He's also a former Goldman banker. So there's a lot of former Goldman bankers coming up today. Alex Rodriguez and Bloomberg's Jason Kelly spoke with Cardinal on the latest episode of The Deal about how sports investing has evolved over time. And so I guess I had a very philosophical moment where I said, you know, what gets me up in the morning? What do I love? And I love playing shadow entrepreneur and I like solving problems with capital. And um, you know, I just it just so happens, you know, luck in people's career. I, I happen to hit an inflection point with sports that I, I couldn't possibly have seen coming. Uh, back in 2000, 2001, right? Uh, you look back on on that the last 20 years, and you're like, wow, you really, you know, luck's great. You really hit a an air pocket that you know you could where you took off. Now the challenge is um, navigating that because now everybody's discovered sports. Yeah, uh, sports is now an asset class. That scares me when I start to hear about things like sports being an asset class. My, wow. my initial yeah. reaction is to run in the other way. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so you know, my, but but I say, yeah, look, you can't make money if you don't put money to work. I like that idea. Solving problems with capital. Most of the world has issues uh, with just getting capital. All right. You can catch that full conversation tonight at 9 p.m. on Bloomberg Originals and tomorrow at 7 p.m. on Bloomberg TV. From New York, this is Bloomberg. A down day in the markets, and it comes before the March U.S. jobs report, which comes out tomorrow morning. Bloomberg Economics is expecting it to show a two-track economy with supported employment in leisure, hospitality, and healthcare, but reduced hiring in other sectors. For more on what we could expect, let's bring in Rubila Faruqi. She is chief economist at High Frequency Economics. Rubila, there are concerns about this uh, return of the two-track economy in which the haves are spending and doing just fine and supporting employment in the sectors in which they're spending. And of course, the have have-nots are worried about their jobs and therefore downgrading their spending and, and cutting spending overall. Will this dichotomy show up in a clear way in this jobs report tomorrow? Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, it's very difficult to make those sort of uh, determinations just by looking at headline payrolls. We, you know, we can see within categories what's going on, but you know, generally it's very difficult to make those determinations. Having said that, you know. What are we seeing? We are seeing job growth that is moderated, but it's still very strong. We have seen the unemployment rate tick up, uh, but it's still you know, below what uh, Fed officials consider the longer, uh, longer run rate. Um, and then you know, we're seeing layoffs. Uh, if you look at the jobless claims numbers, yes, they went up today, but you know, there's noise around the holidays. And also, you're not really seeing the types of things that you would expect to see if the economy was really at risk of a very substantial slowdown. But you are right. I mean, it is, uh, you know, we are seeing in the beige book that consumers are more sensitive, more price sensitive. They're also, uh, you know, uh, shifting their purchases uh, in terms of, you know, from, uh, let's say, high, uh, high end uh, purchases towards lower end. And, you know, those those things are really reflective of what consumers are feeling. But you know, overall, mm -hmm. on a broader scale, the U.S. economy is performing really well, uh, really supported, well supported by a healthy U.S. consumer. 
So the other thing that we know happened, at least at the start of this month, was California passing this 20% fast food minimum wage uh, increase in uh, wages. And we know businesses had to set up for that. They prepared for it. In some cases, they may have reduced hiring or laid off workers as well. I know that this jobs report is for March, but do you think that's going to distort the March wage numbers in any way or start to show up in, in the April and May numbers? Uh, I think probably maybe in the April and May numbers, but you know what we're seeing on the jo in the on the wage data as well, right? I mean, if we look at uh, you know the the year on year changes, we are still seeing a deceleration. We might be you know in a period of one or two months where that effect comes in, it's a little sticky, just as inflation is sticky. But we do think that the you know underlying trend in wage growth is still one of moderation. Underlying trend in inflation is still mod one of moderation. But it's just that, you know, it's just taking a little bit longer. You know, we thought the job market would be quite a bit softer than it is in terms of job growth, but it has proven to be resilient. And we also thought that, you know, um, you know maybe the wage uh, picture would have been better. It is has improved a lot, mm -hmm. but it's just that, you know, the, the numbers in terms of expectations have been very different. The U.S. economy has performed really well, given over 500 basis points of uh, interest rate hikes. Rubila, how do you look at this dynamic over the next week? We have the jobs data tomorrow, certainly a big moment. But next week, we also have inflation right around yeah. the corner. What are you watching more closely and what is going to matter more to investors? Um, I think we'll, we have to watch both things. You know, the Fed is very focused on inflation, but they're also now sensitive to the other part of the dual mandate, which is the employment situation. Uh, you know, this is what uh, we've been discussing is that you know, even if we see robust job growth, you know, that focus and we and we see a deceleration in wages, what we really see in the inflation numbers next week, that's going to be important, but also the retail sales report, right? I mean, if we see a tick up in the unemployment rate and if we see softer retail sales, then that's going to change the whole picture. Mm -hmm. But on inflation, you know, we are seeing, we expect to see an acceleration in the 12 month uh, change in headline CPI and a very small deceleration in the core index. So. Uh, you know, inflation is gradually moving down, but it is much slower than what we were expecting. And right. we still think the PC deflator is probably going to be above target uh, by the end of the year. Rabila, really appreciate your joining us today and giving us your insight. Rabila Faruqi of High Frequency Economics on tomorrow's jobs report and, of course, looking into CPI next Wednesday. We want to head over now to the Bloomberg Intelligence Generative AI Conference, where our own Alex Steele is sitting down with Halima Delane Prado. She is Google's general counsel. Let's listen in. Same way. But what they do allow researchers and innovators to apply is what they call a text data mining exclusion. Again, same deal. You can look at what's out there on the web, subject to some exclusions, right? personal information, sensitive health information, and what have you, but use that for the building blocks of your underlying technology. And so that's sort of the structure that allows innovation to flourish. So where does, it, where does the line get drawn? Like where, I mean, I, I think we had the, the CEO of YouTube on um, the circuit with Emily Chang today saying that OpenAI scrapes stuff that they shouldn't. Okay, I don't really know what scraping means, but it doesn't sound good. What does it actually mean, and, and how do you know, how do you protect yourself from doing it, and how do you protect yourself from having it done to you? All great questions. So I'm going to go back a little bit to that notion of when you actually have content on a website. Mm -hmm. There are a multitude of sort of signals or agreements that are between the content creator, maybe the hoster of the website, and the person that's actually viewing it. So in most cases, I'll use YouTube as an example, we have a terms of service. Content creator says, I'm going to create content. YouTube agrees that content will be used or not used for certain purposes, and it's available. If you're a random user, you know, I've got an aunt that wants to make a cat video. She looks at the terms on, on the website. Other big content providers, Bloomberg, for instance, might actually have a negotiated contract that mm -hmm. says, Google, mm -hmm. you can do this or not this with my data. So we have that existing. Now, the notion of scraping is that a third party doesn't look at those terms, and then will actually sort of view that data and ingest it for their own personal use. Here's where the restrictions come into play. Mm -hmm. Under a US notion with copyright, ingesting that data is OK, subject to certain purposes, most of that being sort of not for commercial use, <laughs> for research use. So now you see where the line has been crossed. Right. right. So fair use, research, yes. Crossing over and making a little money, now you actually have an, a situation. And so what YouTube has sort of prided itself on is that it compensates its creators for their work. And they do that in a myriad of ways. And so when you cross over and use that data for your own commercial venture, 
you've now, you've now sort of crossed the line. And that's sort of the thing that we sort of need to evaluate and figure out what steps need to be taken to protect the, the creator. How clear is all that for you guys? Because you need as much training data as you need, right, in order to get AI up to speed. And then at some point, someone's going to make money off of the AI, and then it crosses over from research into something else. So how do you actively move that line all the time? Yeah, so when you understand what the underlying purpose of, say, the ingestion of the data is for. So I want to use this for research purposes to create a model. Great. You understand sort of what the appropriate sort of rules and restrictions are that govern that use. If then you sort of say, well, I've got a commercial venture in mind, then we assess that. Mm -hmm. It's not just limited to US law. It's looking globally in terms of what applies. Is there a need for licensing? Is there a need for some other sort of notion? And we evaluate it from there. But it's going to be based on the use case each time. Does that slow you down, though? I mean, I can't imagine how many like use case scenarios that come up. I mean, at some point, don't you need some sort of overlay lying rule because going through each one is just going to take up everyone's time too much. So there's high level principles that we have for sort of any sort of AI deployment. We've been super public about this, right? We've got sort of AI principles that talk about how we want to responsibly launch our products, the type of guidelines we apply, the red teaming to check for abuse and what have you. But then it's going to go back to that job that I discussed, that product council, the person that's sitting with the team at the outset to help them navigate building that product and getting it forward. And it's their job to kind of track the laws and the rules to understand, basically, as a partner to the underlying product team. OK, so that sounds like your job is really hard. <laughs> fun, but again, fun. <laughs> for, for, for copyright. Yeah. Uh, OK, so let's, let's take a break from the minutia of that part and just talk about the broad sense. Like, it feels like the debate, on the one hand, is are we crazy? AI is going to wreck everything, and it is really dangerous. What are we doing? A uh, Barry Diller today on CNBC. Okay. Um, versus we have to regulate everything, or let's not do anything at all. We have to let it be free, because we have to see where it goes, because it could really change our entire society. OK, so as a pragmatic lawyer, I'm going to pick something right in the middle. Of course. There it is, right? I'm going to stay on brand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going, to say, I'm going to say this. So AI is too important of a technology not to regulate, full stop. It unlocks amazing opportunity. It democratizes access. It has a just panoply of options that will change society as we know it. It's a once in a generation type experience. But because of that, it is too important not to regulate AI well. So mm -hmm. I actually think, no, you cannot have a world where sort of all things run free. But you actually have to come up with an approach that acknowledges both the potential of the technology, but also acknowledges risk-based harms that that technology can produce. Who is responsible for making all those rules? Who should be responsible, I guess? Are the right people in that room right now? So I think at the end of the day, globally, it's going to be sort of a dialogue amongst government, mm -hmm. um, the tech companies, underlying industries that are using, relying, creating the actual technology, and frankly, civil society. It cannot just be business and government. You have to understand what constituents are worried about, how they see the potential of it, and to have that addressed in the conversation as well. How is it? Are, OK, so are those people in the room right now? I think they're starting to be, right? Okay. I think these conversations, because the technology is Alex Steele there speaking with Google's general counsel at the Bloomberg Intelligence Generative AI Conference. Uh, you can check it out on your Bloomberg terminal by typing Live Go. Now, we're going to stick with Google and AI, because YouTube's CEO, Neil Mohan, says that using YouTube videos to train OpenAI's text-to-video generator would be an infraction of the platform's terms of service. He sat down with Emily Chang, Bloomberg Originals host, for an exclusive conversation. Take a listen. Our terms of service does allow for YouTube content, some YouTube content like the title of a video or the channel name or the creator's name to be scraped because that's how you enable the open web for that content to show up and you know maybe show up in other search engines or what have you and be available that way. But it does not allow for um, things like transcripts or video bits to be downloaded. And that is a clear violation of our TOS. Uh, and so those are the rules of the road in terms of content on our platform. Mohan said he had no firsthand knowledge of whether OpenAI had, in fact, used YouTube videos to refine its AI video creation tool. I mean, there's YouTube videos, which are usually pretty professional, and then there's YouTube Shorts, which is a whole other category unto itself. I hope OpenAI isn't going through all those. Well, it's interesting. It, it begs the question on the role of OpenAI and its relationship to these other firms yes. like Google, right, mm -hmm. Alphabet. But also, if, if they're asking these questions of OpenAI, then who else? Yes, yes. It's not the only AI, generative AI company out there. No, there's more in... Uh, 
uh, we're only at the beginning, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the questions that need to be asked here. Um, in terms of the markets, uh, do we need to ask any questions about the, the performance today? It was a massive sell-off, at least in the last 90 minutes of trade. The S&P 500 closing down one and a quarter percent. And as you noted, tech, uh, the biggest loser here. There are a lot of people that loosened their ties today and said, hey, you know, it's a chill day, jobs tomorrow. Right. But there was a lot of Fed speak that hit the tape. And then, of course, there is a lot of geopolitical uncertainty out there. You see crude topping 86 now. Mm -hmm. And you have the two-year yield hanging out at a stunning level of 464 ahead of jobs tomorrow. And then, again, ahead of CPI next week. So, uh, you know, hold on tight, Scarlett. There could a lot be of data points. A lot of volatility ahead. All right. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Millions of high school seniors who are hoping to finalize where to attend college in the fall are in a bit of a pickle, unable to commit to schools before they know the cost. This comes amid a delay in the rollout of financial student aid. Joining us now is Paulina Cachero. She is Bloomberg News personal finance reporter. And Paulina, I just mentioned to someone the word FAFSA, and they said, oh boy, that's a problem. And this is, this is the root of the problem, isn't it? Yes. So I, to start off, the free application for federal student aid is critical for students who need federal aid to go to college. And this year, um, it underwent a revamp, and it's undergone one of the biggest overhauls in decades. But that revamp has been hit by delay after delay. Now we're at a point where high school seniors are getting their acceptance letters, and usually their financial aid offers come with it. But that's not happening this year. Instead, millions of families are really anxious as they prepare to make a financial commitment to a school without knowing the full cost. It's pretty crazy. Why is it consistently getting delayed and how did we get to this point? So this, the FAFSA Simplification Act was passed in 2020. And in a normal year, the federal application opens in October. But because of this new rollout, it was supposed to open in December. It just got bogged down with delays and basically students weren't able to access this application until January. Not only that, there were a bunch of uh, glitches with the system, students couldn't sign in, and the Department of Education couldn't process these forms. Now we're at a point where universities are just now getting these process forms, giving them very little time to put these financial aid offers together. Um, and even though those um, federal application information is late, students still have to make a commitment to a school at many schools by May 1st. That's a deadline in which students are required to make a commitment. And many students may not have the financial aid package for all the schools they were accepted into. Yeah, it's such a shame because of the work that it took to get to that acceptance letter. And yeah. now they kind of have to make a decision blind. It really doesn't feel very fair. Paulina Cachero, thank you so much. Paulina Cachero covering personal finance for us. All right, let's stay with the education theme here because Cornell University is tapping investors for more than a billion dollars this month, becoming the latest elite school to take advantage of a stable interest rate environment versus last year. Cornell plans to borrow up to $500 million of taxable bonds set to price today, followed by $610 million of tax-exempt bonds next week. Representatives from the school did not respond to requests for comment. In this edition of Muni Moment, we look at the Ivy League bond boom and welcome Dan Slender, Director of Tax-Free Fixed Income at Lord Abbott. Dan, great to see you. I'm going to ask a really dumb question. We just talked about how um, FAFSA delays have made it so that students don't know how to commit to schools or don't know the cost of things. And in some cases, um, the schools themselves who rely on a lot of federal aid are also just as nervous and concerned. When we talk about schools that need to fund financial aid for students, does the money raised through something like one of these bond sales go towards subsidizing student tuition? Well, there's two, two different issues coming this week. So or one this week, one next week. Okay. And the one this week for the taxable municipal bond market is for general purposes. So they can use that for a wide range of purposes. They don't really have to define it. Oh, I that's see. That's how they get in the taxable market. The tax in market, that's more for refinancing some outstanding bonds that, that they wanted to refinance in this environment. So it's not specifically for that this week, but this week's is more general. It can be used a lot of different ways. It can be used, so there's a possibility that it might. I mentioned how um, Cornell is the latest elite schools to take advantage of what's been fairly stable interest rates. When you look at um, the options for your muni investors, 
Do they specifically target um, education bonds? So edu it's funny, education bonds, when you look at the municipal bond market, most people out there think of us as a market for state and local governments, general obligation bonds. But in reality, that's under 30% of the market. Most of it is revenue bonds. So you have universities as a big sector of our market and has been for a long time. So they are a great opportunity in our market. They're high quality bonds in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. a lot of liquidity in the market, and investors are looking for diversification. It's a good way to diversify. Yeah, we just showed a chart, uh, Chanali, that showed that earlier this year, Princeton sold about $1.5 billion of debt, and Harvard sold $750 million of taxable bonds. And insatiable demand for Harvard in particular. I'm curious as to what the draw is here. Is it the tax exempt status? Is it the yields? A lot of it is the, well, the, for, the, for the, obviously for the university, it's the tax exempt ability to issue tax exempt next week, and then the ability to get good rates in the taxable market this week. For investors, the opportunity is tax exempt income and a very high quality credit, and that's typical across Ivy League schools. Now, why, in addition to interest rates, are schools now tapping the bond market. Is it also that you see donor revolts going on here? Are they looking for new sources of income or you know, money to hold them through? Well, a lot of it is the universities, they've been going through a few years where they had a lot of money from uh, the school. Everything's been going really well. Demand's good. Economy's good. And um, they had a lot of stimulus money. So they didn't really have to borrow the last few years. Now it's come to the point where rates have come down a little. There's a lot of investor demand because the rates are attractive. So it's an opportunity for issuers to get decent rates and for investors to get interesting bonds to buy. So in the story that we wrote about this, it was noted that these kinds of issuances don't come very often. I believe that's what you told our reporter. The fact that there is this issuance uh, from Cornell, two parts, and from Harvard, we've seen. Is there a little bit of FOMO going on? If you see the other schools selling bonds, you kind of have to get into it because why not? Let's raise some cash. I'm not sure if it's FOMO. I think it's kind of like they all view it as a opportunity is very strong right now. Mm -hmm. the demand is there. And maybe one of them comes there and gets really strong demand. The next one realizes. But they plan these pretty far in advance. So I think it's just the, it's more the environment. Is they need to borrow. They want to borrow for projects. And the market is very good for borrowing right now. Interesting dynamic going on here. Dan Solander, Director of Tax-Free Fixed Income at Lord Abbott. We thank you so much for your time. And still ahead, what investors need to watch for tomorrow. It's a big day ahead. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Now let's look ahead to what investors are watching tomorrow because there's a lot happening overnight. Certainly when we look at 12.30 a.m. Eastern Time, India's rate decision will impact markets overnight and then also abroad. All day you have the Ambrosetti Forum over in Italy. Of course, we will start our morning tomorrow talking about what's happening there with some key interviews including Ellen Zentner, Noriel Rubini, and Mohamed El Arian of Bloomberg Opinion and Queens College to kick off your day tomorrow. Right ahead of, of course, the 8.30 a.m. jobs report. Report. Of course, a massive moment, not just for the strength here of the labor market, of the U.S. economy, expected to come in with non-farm payrolls at 214,000 and an unemployment rate at 3.8 percent, of course, less expected than that prior unemployment rate of 3.9 percent. Let's see if that holds. But of course, wages are heavily in focus here with upward pressure seen on those wages in the ADP report that was earlier this week. And of course, all day you also have a lot of speaking from Federal Reserve. 
Reserve officials here, Fed Governor Michelle Bowman, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan, and Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin, who's expected to effectively give the same speech as the day before, but updated to reflect that new data of jobs earlier that day. He said that the Fed has time to have some clarity on inflation before cutting interest rates. But for today, that does it for us. Balance of Power is up next. Have a great evening. This is Bloomberg.